Welcome everybody, it's Donald Davidoff, co-founder and CEO of Real Estate Business Analytics, here for another episode of The People Behind the Performance, where I sit down with key leaders and disruptors in our industry to, draw, to dive into what's really driving the real estate industry's success, the role data plays in it all, and to tell the stories of the people behind it. Today's guest, Lynn Patrick Musel, has an extensive professional background holding diverse roles across various industries, uh, commencing his career in 1996 as an account executive at Center Partners. He progressed through factual data, first advantage safe rent, which is where I met him, uh, Accretive Solutions, CoreLogic safe rent, and onsite.com. Uh, this journey led him to the founding of PayReady in 2016, a cloud-based debt management platform tailored to enhance collection processes. His, edu uh, his educational qualifications include a master's of science in organizational leadership from Colorado State University and a bachelor of science in social science, also from Colorado State. Welcome, Lynn. Thank you, really appreciate it. Yeah. So um, it's kind of an interesting transition state going on in the macro economy and certainly in uh, multifamily these days. So as, as you think about the state of the industry today, you know, what's on your mind? And uh, hopefully it doesn't change too much between now and when we publish this because uh, it's volatile, I think. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's definitely a lot. Um, there's been a lot happening, you know, coming out of the pandemic, um, finding the new normal with everything and then uh, you know the buzzword of the day AI. So there's mm -hmm. there's a lot of new participants in in the space, um, and so things are evolving rather quickly. Um, so to, to me, it's a really exciting time. I feel really mm -hmm. fortunate to have come through things the way that we did. Um, in a lot of ways, we were a beneficiary of the pandemic um, in that a lot of more attention got paid to compliance around how debt management is handled. Um, yeah how you're able to track and control processes around those things um and so now it's now it's it, there's a bit of a race to you know the convergence of ai solutions and centralized leasing and how what do you do with mm -hmm. all the data that you've accumulated and those kinds of things so it's i, I think it's a really exciting time yeah I'm, I'm curious what i mean you mentioned ai a couple times i mean there's god there's so much hype about ai um in fact i, I just coming back from optech less than a month ago what I found interesting was the ratio of talk about AI to the number of actual examples, at least generative AI, right? I sort of mm -hmm. want to separate predictive AI, generative AI, and even in generative AI, right? There's the there's the lease hawks and lease AIs and the sort of leasing stuff that's been around for a while now. I think people are pretty used to that and figuring out how to do that. But in terms of the amount of talk around generative AI uh, against what I saw was a dearth of actual real world examples. So I sort of still feel like, to me, it still feels like we haven't gotten to Gartner's peak of inflated expectations on the hype cycle. I'm curious what you think. I, I agree completely. Um, it's it's a fun buzzword uh, that everyone's throwing around. Um, but when you really dig into it and ask the second and third questions, what's real today feels a lot more mostly like decision tree sort of chat bot type ideas and things like that, not mm -hmm. actual generative AI. Um, mm -hmm. So, and, 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 and even with that, um, whatever tools you are building, what data sets do you really have access to? What's missing from those? What does the AI even have an opportunity to talk to and pull from? Mm -hmm. yeah. So I think a lot of that'll get sorted out, I guess, over, over time. Um, where, where my mind is with it is, uh, you know, we've invested pretty heavily in that area on the development side. Um, mm -hmm. We've got seven years worth of deep move out related data, very specific move out related data that we're starting to comb through. Mm -hmm. um, and then and then from our standpoint, also the resident interaction piece, you know, we've got automated solutions and voice solutions and text and email and that sort of thing. Um, and you know, we're building and testing hybrid solutions because even with that, when you have resident interaction, there still needs to be escalation points yeah. um, and off ramps to human behavior that feel natural. Um, so where this all meets with the idea of centralized leasing and um, mm -hmm. the, the communication part of things, I think is going to be really interesting. Um, we're, we're, we're in an interesting position on this whole concept where um 
when you talk about cent the idea of centralized leasing, there's a lot of focus on the onboarding of residents and capturing of residents and that sort of thing. Um, when you talk about collections or move out related things and debt management, it's a natural fit for it to be off ramped from the leasing yeah. staff. They don't want to deal with it anyway. Yeah. Um, and in some cases, those functions are already centralized in accounts receivable teams and things like that. So yeah. the tool sets that we've been able to build around those things, it's kind of like I, I, I joke that we were kind of centralized leasing before it was cool. Um, yeah. And uh, and so we're just continuing to build that out and build the tools around it. And I guess to jump back to the AI piece is, you know, where do we find the happy marriage between um, the intersection of those communication tools and the data analysis and what do you do with those things as, as long as there is that you know, off-ramp ability to escalate yeah. dispute handling. It gets, you know, it gets a little more complicated than it sounds on the surface. Yeah, it's interesting. I, I mean, we just uh, we just released a point of view paper on AI, obviously more from a, a you know, what does it mean for data analytics? Uh, so anybody listening, you can get that on our website, uh, getreba.com, just go to the resource center. And, and a lot of what you said resonated with me on that. Um, we're, we're pretty cynical about predictive AI for this industry. Um, I... You know, if you caught me seven, eight years ago, I would have been extremely bullish on it. And then I got involved in a couple projects and learned like how much data you really need to do good predictive analytics. And, uh, you know, we don't have terabytes and petabytes of data. So um, a lot of times classical modeling works quite well. I, I do think on the generative side, it's, it's really interesting. There's a lot of sort of bar tricks or parlor tricks that are cute, but uninteresting. And at the same time, I think of applications like you're talking about where it's mostly administrative work and you can constrain the AI. Like one of the things I worry about generative AI is hallucinations. I've actually experienced that using um, chat GPT on a couple things. Um, but in the chatbot world and, and like, on a, I, I would think on a focused solution, like just trying to take the, the normal people communication side out of debt collection, a lot could be done where it's not going to hallucinate because the sandbox is small enough. And then to your point, it can escalate to a person at the right time, as long as you teach it where the escalation points are, where it may even be you know, quasi-rules-based as opposed to pure machine learning. Um, curious, does that resonate with you or that's sort of how I yeah. feel about your world? Yeah, 100%, 100%. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, and I agree on the sandbox idea. And we've, and we've also been a little careful because there's obviously a lot of amazing tools available, mm -hmm. but we've been careful in the testing to make sure there aren't those hallucinations that get too far outside the boundaries. Yeah. You have to have those guardrails in place, um, particularly when you're talking about a highly compliant, highly regulated yeah. I was just you know, about to space. go there. Yeah, like if, 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 it, uh, if an acquisitions person is building a comp set and they get a hallucinated community, no blood, no foul, in your world, right, you, you could end up, you know, in front of state boards and other really nasty places you don't want to be. Exactly. Yeah. Makes sense. Okay. Well, let's get out of that. Let's get out of that sort of uh, little spiral down. Uh, what can go wrong with AI? Uh, <laughs> switch gears. Something a little more personal uh, in in nature. Uh, you know, I I read off your 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 bio, your CV, but maybe tell a little bit about your origin story in industry. Like exactly how did you get involved in multifamily? I mean, you and I, God, we must have met 20 years ago. I want to say maybe even a little more. I can't remember. Um, so that's, a, that's probably about right. Yeah. yeah. So, so, uh, yeah, share with everyone how you ended up in multifamily. Um, I, I mean, you'd mentioned one of my, the companies in my background, factual mm -hmm. data. I was in Colorado with a company called factual data and we were reselling credit information. Um, and one of my clients at the time was a little startup called safe rent, uh, out of Denver. That was really the first company to do to convince apartment operators to make score-based leasing decisions. Yep. Um, and I got very interested in what they were doing and talked myself into a position there. Um, and then that eventually, that business was sold to a much larger uh, database mm -hmm. company. It's gone through a lot of name changes, First American, First Advantage, yeah. CoreLogic, it was all one, one entity. Um, and there I headed up the, the sales team as well as uh, some of the account management team and then uh, launch, help them launch a renter's insurance program, one of the first real, mm -hmm. real sort of focused renter's insurance programs for multifamily housing. Um, and took a little break from the industry, uh, worked for a consulting business for a bit, 
and then got back in with Onsite and uh, mm -hmm. and led their sales team. Um, and Onsite, I guess for those that don't know, was a company that was a screening company as well as really focused on uh, online leasing. So the whole mm -hmm. move-in process, um, modernizing the leasing yeah. process and moving it online. Um, and then eventually that business was sold to RealPage. Um, and I had always wanted to start my own company. Um, mm -hmm. There's a little tight group of us from OnSite that were collaborating on these ideas. And I really didn't have a def I, I had the general idea that the move out process and the collection process was messy, but um, I wasn't dead set on starting that business, but I started to talk to clients and just ask them what part of the resident life cycle had not been sufficiently addressed with technology. Mm -hmm. um, and it was just interesting because so much focus again is on resident acquisition, you know, dealing with current yeah. residents. Um, but there really weren't a lot of great tools and processes to help assist with the move out process to make that the final accounting as clean as possible, the communication as positive as possible, um, not lose track of things, you know, still see where the money is. And th there just wasn't anything really there. And in, in a lot of ways it created um, brand risk at move out. If yeah. there's not really good communication, you know, the leasing staff is more incentivized to deal with current residents and new residents. And so the whole thing was a bit of an afterthought. Um, and it just, just, decided to bootstrap it completely on my own, um, hired a developer, had a couple of clients that were great partners and built a, basically it started as a CRM for their accounts receivable team. Okay. Um, and, and then it just grew from there. So the layers that eventually got built in were uh, to become a, a move out portal for the residents, to run the payments through one platform. So all the reporting and financials could be in one place. Mm -hmm. um, and create as positive an experience as possible quickly after move out. You know, the most mm -hmm. the most important time to try to clean things up is as quickly as possible. Yeah. And um, traditionally, you know, this it would sit on a leasing agent's desk and maybe something would happen and then eventually it would go to a collection agency and they're getting calls, you know, without a lot of communication in between. So we were able to fill that gap with technology and then also partner with, um, staffing partners that help with the outreach and communication. Um, and then eventually we ended up with a marketplace of collection agencies that um, high performing agencies that mm -hmm. are excited to show their work um, and be a part of a marketplace where reporting is uh, pure because all the yep. payments are going through one place. Yeah. Um, and, and then it's just grown from there. So that was, yeah, about, I guess it was about roughly seven years ago, but we, mm -hmm. uh, We've been really fortunate to grow organically, um, and I, I laugh. I say that we solve the least profitable, most complicated part of the whole payment flow. Yeah. Um, but, yeah. but but it ended up working out well. No, I was say that the 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 unsexy parts often don't attract as much attention, so they're a real opportunity. Um, I'm, I'm I'm glad someone's out there working on that problem. So when when you think about your whole career, um, I mean, certainly many people have influenced you. You know, who's who's your most influential professional mentor? Um, I've had, well, I've definitely had several over the years. Um, um, my direct leader that I worked with for a long time was Monty Jones. Yeah. Um, I, I was going to say, you were it, crazy enough to go work for him a second time after you already knew him. So that was yeah. on you. Yeah. I work, we worked together at a couple of different places, which is great. Um, uh, you know, there, and there's there's several. Uh, Jane Carrington from Onsite from a product yeah. sort of strategy standpoint has been a great yeah. mentor for me as well. Yeah. Um, I've got a good friend, Chad Scott, who uh, started ePremium and um, has helped me a lot on the business side of things, understand how investment, mm -hmm. the investment side of the, the back end of the business works yeah. um, because I just cool. came from operations. So I had to learn how to navigate, you know, the, the back end of running a business and how investments are structured and that sort of thing. Yeah. So um, Mark Stringer, from Avenue Five has been a great mentor as far as the actual product development and been very helpful. And um, yeah, there's been a whole whole bunch of folks. Excellent. Yeah, um, I know I know Monty well, obviously, from especially from the Safe Rent days. He's one of my favorite guys in the industry. Um, let uh, you know, thinking a little bit about uh, you know current business and where you are in that journey. 
you know, what, what's, what's maybe the biggest challenge you're facing and how are you working to overcome that? I think, well, the biggest challenge that we have, and I'm, I'm going to jump back a little bit to the earlier part of the conversation, but I think the biggest mm -hmm. challenge we have is whenever there's an upheaval in uh, technology or a, a leap forward in the tools that you have available to yourself, mm -hmm. how do you incorporate those into an existing tech stack and structure? You know, sometimes it's easier to start from scratch, right? But when right. you start oh, yeah. actually... When you've started to actually build something, um, you have to be nimble enough to adjust to incorporating all this new stuff, but still keep, you know, keep the whole foundation in place. Um, and I think we're doing that really well. We've brought a lot of uh, good folks on this year and uh, really built the foundation of the business in the back end to do that. But that's, I think that's part of the challenge is, you know, the best, the best way to incorporate the new stuff without breaking the old stuff. <laughs> Yeah, no, that makes that makes Use technical sense. terminology. There you go. So what's what, what's maybe one thing about the industry that Lynn today, right, 2023 Lynn knows that maybe Lynn back from factual data didn't know, and you 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 know in hindsight wish 2023 Lynn could go back and teach him that way back when. Oh, that's a good. What I know today that I didn't know then. Um, <laughs> I th I think um, if I were looking at starting a business the thing i've learned is like you know you can have the you can have the greatest idea or the coolest gadget but the deep thinking to really connect it to the real world um mm -hmm. and how it gets pulled through so you know when you, when you think about it's like the it, it's the old terminology with the internet where they say the final mile is the hardest part Right. You know, they could get the, the big fiber optic lines run, but to get it to get it to your actual bedroom is that this is the hardest part. I, you know, that that has always been the case uh, with, I think, multifamily housing as, as well. It's the mm -hmm. it's that it's getting to the actual leasing yeah. office to the interaction with the resident. Um, and, you know, it took probably took me a while to understand how critical that is. But but if your technology solution can help really solve that final mile, mm -hmm. then you become incredibly sticky. Yeah. Um, th that that's where you're not as easy, easily replaced. Yeah. So what, I mean, wh what is that metaphorical final mile for pay ready in terms of your go to market? Like, I mean, you've been involved in sales and go to market in this industry for longer than 95% of the salespeople I know, right? I mean, all the way back to the late nineties or early aughts um, back in those safe rent days. Um, you know, I, I just, I think you could teach a lot of people like, you know, just using pay ready as example today, what's the thing that's hardest, you know, the biggest barrier to getting a, an operator to, to choose to work with you and, and how do you guys overcome that? Well, the, the way that we overcame it is the way we structured everything from the, the beginning was literally to require as little involvement as possible from site level staff. Mm -hmm. That was that was a core tenant from the very beginning. It's like whatever yeah. we build, let's 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 uh, not add to the staff, but take away. Yeah. Um, and particularly, it's a little bit easier when you're in our world because it's something they don't want to do anyway. Right. Um, so uh, so the, the way we've structured everything is like we're one of the few things that doesn't require a login and a password management for site staff. I mean, yeah. down to that level of granularity, right? So. Um, if you're going to, you know, when we come in and replace existing processes, you know, there's a little bit, there's setup with the integrations and all that sort of thing. And there's once in a while, there's some interaction that has to happen with the site staff, but it's completely automated with links through email and that sort of thing. But we're not requiring active interaction with the software. Yeah. So from a training and onboarding implementation standpoint, we've made it a bit of a no brainer, you, you know, because what you'll run into is in from my experience, most operators, one of the biggest hangups is change management. Yep. You know, they have turnover, they yep. have staff, they only have so many systems they want to deal with. You have you have to make sure yep. whatever you create, you're thinking about things like single sign-on and integrating with their current processes and making it look and feel as much as possible like their current day-to-day -day thing. Um, yep. So we focused a lot on just whatever we build, make it um, make it not you know, not a requirement for the staff to directly interact with it a lot. And so oh, that's pretty brilliant. the on the, the 
the onboarding piece um, is uh, change management's always the tough one. Yep. So switch, switching gears from the soft side to maybe the harder side again. I mean, you, you know, you you've been involved in credit screening, right? One of the more data analytical uh, applications in the business. Obviously, you know, my bread and butter in the early years in this industry was pricing revenue management. Maybe the only application more analytical than, than credit screening. So you you and I both share that sort of just I don't know. We've just been swimming in the data world for so long. One of the things that I've noticed though is like. When I talk about data-driven decision making, that means something very specific to me as a as a, a former data analyst, a former project manager, right? Long before I <clears throat> became CEO of a tech company. But I find you know lots of different stakeholders in this industry attach very different meanings when they're talking about data decision or data-driven decision making. So I was really curious with your background. You know, when I say data-driven decision making, what what does that mean to you? Well, a little more granular in our space, mm -hmm. um, what it, where those two things meet are they're really looking to us to, to be able to analyze a specific file or account or resident record uh -huh. and decide what to do with it, right, based on history. So uh -huh. um, depending on the balance size, depending on, you know, uh, resident information that we gather, demographic information, it, you know, does this, does mm -hmm. this account require a softer touch for a longer period of time? Are they going to react better to what type of messaging that's put out to them? Um, does it need to be routed through a legal process? Because history tells us with these different characteristics that that's probably the best route for this account to, you know, yep. be taken into. And and so it, if you go back to, you know, say safe right in the early days of applicant screening, the, the whole thing was, hey, let's let, trust us to just make the decision for you. Right. right, we're gonna take this whole thing off your hands. <clears throat> we'll just make the call. And so really I applied that same logic to the, the recovery process. Yeah, which, well, that, that's actually a perfect segue to a question that was bouncing around my head, which is, yeah, you're taking a lot off their hands, yet this is a business where people, you know, historically they like to have control. Like I'm, I'm gonna, I'm gonna, if I strike out, I'm gonna strike out swinging, right? I'm gonna sink or swim on my own. And so letting go of something, even something they don't wanna do, but but by letting go, they have to trust an algorithm or something else. That that can sometimes be a challenge. How have you gotten people to trust the algorithms as as opposed to try to hoard all the decision making themselves? Yeah, it well for starters, it is it is a thing that um, in some cases you know they like to control it. Other cases they realize they didn't really have control over it because there wasn't there's no tool or system. Mm -hmm and to enable control, right? Yeah. So there was no visibility from the executive level to even know what was happening at the site level post move mm -hmm. out um, or very little. And then in, ter you know, in terms of the actual control over the process, uh, what we find is and it varies from client to client. Some clients are very uh, performance focused. So they're you know wanting, wanting to make sure that the recovery is as high as possible. We have some clients mm -hmm. that are way more brand risk focus that just want to make sure they have the nicest exit possible with the resident yeah. and everything in between. So um, the way that we build trust with all those things is, it, you know, it started with just working working really closely with our clients. And then we started to build a, you know, a track record of history and results that we can, we can prove out and share. Um, and then testimonials. We've been really fortunate that, thank goodness, we've got uh, almost complete client retention. Um, and most of that, some of that's tied to the outcomes, the financial outcomes. Some of it's tied to the fact that the uh, the lease, leasing staff has got a lot more time on their hands to do other things. Um, and a big part of it's been tied to, there's been no brand damage. In fact, brand uh, reputation scores have gone up when they've utilized our, our service, so. Are you, are you still bootstrapped or do you have uh, investors? Uh, we have some private investment. Um, but but still majority controlled, which is kind of unique yeah. in our industry. It, it, it's hard to hold on to a tech company. The, the dilution rounds, uh, you know, reduce the control pretty quickly. Um, and one more question before we uh, we get to the just fun part at the end. Um, you know, again, you 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 know, like me, you've been around more than two decades. Um, so lots changed in the industry. 
Um, you know, what are one or two things that you would point to as maybe the most fundamental changes that have occurred over those 20 plus years? Uh, you know, I would say, at least in my opinion, um, when I first started, the industry was considered way behind on technology, way behind all other industries. Mm -hmm. um, I have seen over that time a lot of, um, a lot more, um, you know, highly educated people coming into the space on both sides, both the, the provider side as well as the operator side. Mm -hmm. um, and a lot more, pro, you know, progressive people in terms of adopting technologies and experimenting with things. So I think there's a little bit of a reputation, in my opinion, historically, that the industry is way behind, like a dinosaur. Mm -hmm. um, in some ways now, like you mentioned, NMHC, you know, there's a lot of kind of future promise talk about all this technology that's coming out. It yeah. almost feels like the pendulum's gone the other way where there's a lot of experimentation happening. There's a lot of attention being paid. I think everyone knows that the, you know, the rental industry, the prop tech's a buzzword in the in the finance space and mm -hmm. in investment space, prop tech, insure tech. Everyone's, yeah. everyone's got to have a place to live. Home ownership's getting harder. There's, there's going to be more and more rentals. So there's a lot of attention being paid to it. And I think that's pushing technology into the space. So it's almost like, in my, it, it almost feels like it's pushed push the other way where yeah. you almost have to rein back the technology back into reality. Yeah, no, that's an interesting perspective. I, I hadn't thought about it, but, you know, come to think of it, like, I mean, I I went, I got my first Optech or the predecessor of Optech um, at NMHC. God, my first one was probably like 2002 or 2003, something like that. And then here in 2023, I mean, there must have been a dozen PE or VC companies there who were looking to meet vendors, right? Like yeah. it's always the, you know, oh, it's, you know, the vendor to operator ratio, et cetera, right? And all the vendors want that ratio to be as low as possible. And all of a sudden here's this group of PE and VC vendor or VC providers and, and investment banks as well, you know, advisory banks. They all love that there were a ton of vendors there. I mean, I, I personally had at least four meetings between a combination of, you know, potential advisory services on future deals and or the VC or PE directly. And I'm sure there was a half a dozen there that I, I didn't even you know have time or exposure to meet with. That's really quite a change. Yeah, I did. Yeah, I had the same experience. Like the the, the, the month or two leading up to it, it was an onslaught yeah. of- Yeah, yeah, yeah. usually when I, when I first became a vendor, I just stopped getting emails, except from dumb vendors who didn't call their list and were trying to sell me stuff. You know, and now yeah. you actually, you know, guys like you and me are actually getting emails from the VC mm. and PE and the banks wanting to, wanting to meet with us. That is a big change. Hey, so um, now that we've done the heavy lifting, we always like to end these interviews with a little kind of fun, rapid fire, James Lipton style Q&A, if you remember the original yeah, yeah. Inside the Actors Studio. So uh, as I say every time, just one rule, don't think too hard, okay? So question one, what book has influenced you the most? Uh, most recently, Reframe Your Brain by Scott Adams. I just, cool. I just, I just read it and um, been, Deploying Scott, some of the ideas. Is Scott Adams the same guy who did Dilbert, or am I remembering the name wrong? Or it's mm -hmm. just two Scott. It's the same. It's the same Scott yeah. Adams. Same oh, I gotta, get that. Yeah. I gotta get, get. I gotta get that book then. Cool. Yeah. Uh, what's your favorite time of day? Morning, uh, early morning. Yep. What What is your favorite app? Oh, X. <laughs> I probably spend the most time on X. Yes, formerly known as Twitter. <laughs> uh -huh. uh, what is what's your biggest pet peeve? A loud eating. <laughs> <laughs> uh, what's your spirit animal? Snow leopard. Snow leopard. That's pretty precise. You gotta tell me. You gotta give me at least one sentence on that. I, you know what it was? It was uh, I was in New Orleans and a psychic pulled me off of the side of the street and told me that I was a snow leopard. So I just <laughs> took it. Stuck with it. I like that. Yeah, she 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 claimed it for me. There I you just go. thought it was fun. So that is that that's uh, that was not the sense I expected. <laughs> um, if you had to pick one food to eat forever, what would you eat? Macaroni and cheese. And what is your go-to for having a good laugh? Mm. Um, the movie Step Brothers. Cool. Well, thanks for sharing your insights with us today, Lynn. Uh, where can everybody find out anything more about you uh, or pay ready, particularly online? 
payready.com. Um, a lot of information on LinkedIn as well. Um, so yeah. Excellent. Well, thanks again for being with us. Thank you. Really appreciate it.